Welcome to Palillo Points. I'm Brandon Stranger, Sports Map Houston. He is Charlie Palillo of ESPN 97.5, 92.5. And if you have not already, please hit like and subscribe on the channel. Charlie, welcome in. Um, we're a quarter of the way through Astro season, and it has been a tale of three seasons for them. Hot start, big losing skid, and then lamb killers. Charlie, I want to ask you this. Do we know who this team is yet? Uh, work in progress, but I think we have a general idea. It's a uh, it's a uh, top heavy to two thirds heavy, uh, very good offense. It's a starting rotation with depth and flexibility that's already being tested. One that is without a true ace. Someone you'd say starting game one of a postseason series. I think I have the better pitcher on the mound, unless maybe finally Lance McCullers is blossoming into a guy who will combine outstanding pitching and command with good health, right? That's a long play call, not a quarter of the season to say, oh, he's there now. And the bullpen is a huge question mark. Just about everyone before Ryan Presley has been a little bit iffy. I think you give Brent Strom the benefit of the doubt over the course of the season that'll sort their way through. Uh, and Oli Paredes just getting back from his hiatus uh, figures to give them another live arm in there. And if they can get the starting rotation hole, Framber Valdez, Jake Odorizzi, both making their first rehab starts for Sugarland this week. Might that mean a Christian Javier actually is the one who gets pushed to the bullpen? And if so, that could be a real fortification with maybe a multi-inning quality arm ahead of Presley in a primary setup role. But they have been grooming Javier to be, uh, you know, they were trying to stretch him out, right? So when there weren't spots in the, in the lineup, in the rotation, they sent him to the alternative training site to where they could give him starters innings. So would he be the first one? Because you mentioned Fromber Odorizzi coming back. We don't know what the timetable is in Ar Arcidi yet. You assume he's going to be back. Someone's got to be the odd man out. Is, is Javier your guess? Yes, uh, Arkady now the latest variable. Shoulder discomfort is not encouraging to hear. You know, he shouldn't be fatigued this early into the season. Uh, maybe better than hearing elbow discomfort or forearm discomfort that, oh, two steps later, it's Tommy John surgery, which Arkady already has in his history. Uh, we know Granky's in the rotation no matter what. We know McCullers, if healthy, is in the rotation no matter what. At the money they gave Odorizzi, Unless he is terrible over an extended period of starts, I presume he's generally in the rotation no matter what. I think Javier has a more flexible, fungible arm to go to the bullpen and maybe be asked to pitch back-to-back -back days or three times in five days, more so than Anarchiti. And Fromber, once healthy and built up, you know he's going into the rotation. So in the numbers game, it could well be Javier, even if it's not a straight on merit decision. Who's our sixth best qualitative starting pitcher right now? That's the guy who's out. Uh, I wouldn't think Javier rates as lowly as number six, but I think he's the guy maybe most logically earmarked for the role that whoever's dropped from the rotation would fill in the pen. I want to switch gears to the offense for a second because Altuve, Correa, and Tucker have all seemed to pull themselves out of this offensive funk that they've been in. A couple of guys who are still in the funk, Miles Straw and Martin Maldonado. And the fans are starting to get a little restless on this just because you've got a guy like Jason Castro and a guy like Chas McCormick who they continue to look good in spot starts. Is this a case of like rose-colored glasses, grass greener, backup quarterback sentiment, or are Castro and McCormick guys who Dusty should really give a look at for more opportunities? I think Castro should be playing more than Maldonado, who's never been a plus offensive player, but you can't hit 155 and command two-thirds of the playing time giving any reasonable alternative. And so to the backup quarterback analogy, right, Jason Castro has a pretty long track record as not exactly being Mike Piazza or Joe Maurer as a threat in the batter's box, but he is discernibly better than Maldonado. And behind the plate, while Castro does not have the throwing arm of the machete, well, limiting the opposing running game is not a big deal in this era of baseball because not many teams run very much. And Castro also scores well in the pitching framing stuff and how he handles a pitching staff. So I would think there should be more of a balance there. Uh, as for Straw, it does not help his cause when Chaz McCormick pops the rare home run or a key two-run single for insurance in the, the win back on Sunday. Though Straw followed with an insurance single of his own. Uh, I think Dusty's kind of enamored with the idea of the speed though it doesn't translate into Straw being a plus defensive center fielder because he doesn't take the best of routes. He's also just an average arm out there. But McCormick doesn't loom as a real quality alternative. It's still very early, 
But Jose Siri at AAA Sugarland has been an RBI machine and hit 471 the first seven, eight games of the season. If he has another big month, maybe that is the guy you look at. Interesting to me that the Cuban, they spent $4 million to sign Pedro Leon with the thinking of, okay, there's our post-Springer long-term center field option. Well, they're giving him a look at shortstop because they may need a long-term post-Correa option, and if it's not going to be Jeremy Pena. So a lot of moving parts, but in part, someone's supposed to hit eighth and ninth and not be really good and make a lot of outs. But incremental improvement can really make a difference. The fine print in championship level versus very good. The 2017 Astros is exhibit A for me in Astros history when Josh Reddick batting eighth a lot of the year had a tremendous year. And for batting ninth, you got quality production uh, out of Brian McCann, right? Not big numbers overall, but for your number nine hitter. So one through six, they look pretty solid when healthy. Seven through nine, they're a little bit iffy, but still overall, uh, this should, should at least be, at least be a top five American League offense. You brought up Carlos Correa, so let's talk about him and uh, in this thing. Correa's been an enigma. We mentioned his offense has looked better. Uh, over the past few games, but in this lineup, he doesn't exactly stick out. And that says more about the lineup than it does for him. But let's say Correa stays on pace where he hits, let's say 260, 25 home runs, 80 RBIs. Could James Click really give him the largest contract on a team no. considering you have all these no. guys that are raking up and down the lineup? Nope, and even if Correa has a healthy season, a healthy full season, the only time he's ever done that is 2016. If he does it this year in his salary drive year, I don't think he's more committed to staying healthier. He'd have just stayed healthier. <laughs> but without monstrous production, uh, I don't think you give an attendance badge to the tune of an eight-year, 10-year contract at $30 million per year. Again, it's still early. It's still early. It's still early. I don't think the Mets have payer's remorse on Francisco Lindor. But so far, not so good. Um, Corey Seager with the Dodgers is now out injured for at least a month. He's approaching free agency, a player with a better performance pedigree overall than Correa. Uh, Carlos Correa in this lineup should be hitting sixth or seventh. I don't think you pay that kind of money, even playing a premium defensive position to a guy like that who will still have the health questions in the background that contribute largely to why Correa has never hit 25 home runs in a season. He's hit 300 once. He's driven in 85 runs once. He scored more than 80 runs once. And then you have the performance components where in 2018, he hit 239. In the short season of 2020, he wasn't very good. He was great for two, three weeks in the playoffs. But his postseason career, it's been a mix of sensational postseasons with very meh postseasons. The mega dollar long term contracts, I think you pay those on sustained, proven track record of durability and excellence. Correa is just not there. But someone's going to pay it, right? Um, if the Dodgers don't pay up for Seeger, if the Yankees yet again fail to reach the World Series and they know Glaber Torres is a bad shortstop defensively, well, if you're Carlos Correa, those are your two fantasy markets to be interested. And as always, it only takes one willing to go to that nutso level. Uh, I'll bet under $300 million on Correa, but he won't be spotted in a food line, a bread line, anytime in the next thousand years. Unless he's trying to buy nachos at Minute Maid, which he may need that multi-million dollar contract. Charlie, I appreciate the time as always. We'll talk soon. There are always dollar dogs on Tuesdays, Brandon.